All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started here. It's 9.05 Central Time on the dot, so uh, I want to make sure that we just kind of jump right in. So first of all, I just want to say very much uh, thank you to everybody for taking the time out of your day to sit here and and talk about the state of video as we see it here in 2018. I think there's a lot of moving parts that's going on with video, and specifically as I talk to you know agencies or direct businesses um, about digital advertising, a lot of the questions actually are coming up around video these days. Um, specifically about connected TV or advanced TV. So uh, we wanted to take a little bit of time to kind of call out exactly what it is, how the market's responding to it. From connected TV at the top, all the way down to YouTube capabilities that are kind of new and improved from what we've been able to do in years past. Um, my name is Joe Jost. I'm a vice president of business development at Ad Taxi. I support some of our East properties. Um, but just wanted to um, make sure that, again, I say thanks to all of you for, for taking that time out of your day. So jumping into today's agenda, you've got a lot, quite a, a lot to, uh, to talk about today. I think the first thing is really digging into cord cutters and cord nevers. I think that term gets used pretty widespread, but outside of it just being you know, the definition, people who have kind of cut the cord with traditional pay TV, I want to really dig into who are they, what's their demographics, how are they digesting video so that we can start to target these people um, knowing that connected TV and advanced TV is starting to take off. Then we'll jump into some video really showcasing different usage patterns as well as um, you know, how the industry is buying video. So I think there's some really interesting stuff there. But then we'll spend the majority of the time talking about these next three sections. And I think it's kind of the dual purposes of video. The first is that 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 video to drive awareness and awareness vehicle. So sitting at the top of the funnel. And that's where we'll spend a lot of time talking about connected TV and some of its interesting capabilities and really highlighting the differences between connected TV and broadcast TV. And then we'll spend some time talking about more of the bottom funnel, right? So video to drive intent or to be that conversion vehicle. Um, I think oftentimes video is not thought of as in terms of, of driving conversions and kind of low funnel activity. So spend some time talking about interesting YouTube capabilities uh, that I think are a little bit different than we've been accustomed to thinking about in the past. And then of course, we'll spend some time just wrapping it up. So jumping right in, I wanna roll back the clock a little bit um, and just kind of start to look at something similar that happened not too long ago. So while these days the term cord cutter generally refers to people who are moving away from kind of those traditional pay TV um, subscriptions, it's, it's, it's important to remember that this term actually originated in telecom. So in the mid 2000s with the rise of mobile phones, um, households began seeing the landline telephone as unnecessary and people started you know, to, to cut the cord. And eventually they moved to entirely mobile households. So back in 2004, you can see there on the chart, nearly all homes had a landline. But if you fast forward 10 years to about the year 2014, you start to see that there's that inflection point that's occurred, right? So the decline of, land loan, uh, the, decline of the landline uh, telephone has been steady. Um, and these days, you know, in 2018, there's more homes that have no landline at all. So they're mobile only households. And I think what's more interesting to point out is that telecom statistics were oftentimes propped up on office environments, right? So employees having landlines at every single one of their desks or their cubicles or whatever it might be. My guess is that a fair number of you on the phone are probably dialing on a landline from your office as well. So again, had offices kind of jumped on that bandwagon, we'd start to see this decline a little bit more uh, sharp or we'd see in it more of an accelerated decline, I think, in kind of those usage statistics. But it's important to look at this trend because what we see here, this graph that happened in telecom, it's the reality of our TV industry at this point in time as well. So this, what you see right here, is that template for what's happening uh, in, in TV. So looking then at the TV industry, if we kind of pretend that we're overlaying this on top of the last chart that we see, we're right around the year 2010 when compared to the landline telephone decline. So this year, so 2018, nearly 68 million people will have either cut the cord or be a cord never, um, which results in about 27% of all US adults. And then just four, near, four years from now, by the year 2022, about 95 million people will be cord cutters or cord nevers, representing about 35% of US adults. So pretty interesting increase that we see, especially within cord cutters. Um, but the industry believes that by the year 2030, 
right? So not too long from now, more than 50% of US households will be cord cutters or cord never. So that will be kind of that inflection point uh, you know, that, that I reference in the last slide about landline telephones. And what's interesting is that this statistic, that year of 2030 where that inflection point occurs, could easily be accelerated given recent trends as well. Everything that we see shows that um, adoption of cord cutting or, or, or moving away from subscription TV is actually happening faster than any forecasts that have heard that have taken place so far. So interesting things right there. But there's many similarities between cord cutters and cord nevers. And the first thing I want to do is just define them. Uh, a cord cutter is defined as a person or a household that has cut the cord, has moved away from subscription uh, TV or paid subscription TV in the past year, whereas cord nevers are referred to as people have who have never paid for subscription TV or have not paid for it in the past five years. So maybe they cut the cord, you know, six years ago, something like that. Now that person would be bundled up as a cord never. So, um, you know, while there's many similarities between these groups, I think there's also a couple differences that I want to point out. The first thing to call out is how high YouTube actually features um, in the preferred streaming services for both sets, right? So YouTube's reach should, I think, never be understated. It's the second largest search engine out there, second only to Google. And of course, Google owns YouTube, so there's a lot of really cool you know, cross-pollination that can take place between the two things. And, um, and, you know, as a result of this scale and this preference, you know, that's the reason that I'll be sharing some of YouTube's newest features with you today um, later on in, in the discussion. But beyond that, notice how cord cutters and cord nevers diverge in the type of content that they view, right? So cord cutters are looking at PBS, Disney, A&E, some of that long format video. And cord nevers are looking at Vivo, BBC News, and more of that short video, short form video content. And the reason I call this out is simply because it would take a blend of both connected TV, which is good for its longer format video setting. It's kind of that um, lean back video watching experience, as well as taking um, efforts from addressable TV, which is watching content on you know, your smartphones or connected devices, which is more conducive to um, shorter format video. So it would take a blend of both connected TV and addressable TV to truly reach both of these groups um, you know, effectively. And I'll get into those differences between connected TV and addressable TV in a little bit too. But I just want to call that out because it's something to think about as we start kind of mapping out plans in the back of our head throughout today's webinar. But lastly, um, the thing that I want to call out is the average household income. So at $41,000 and $52,000 respectively, you know, I don't think that's not exactly right. A C-level executive who's making hundreds of thousands of dollars or, you know, families that are, that are pulling in, you know, $100,000, $200,000, et cetera. But what this is, is the young families and the future families of America, right? So this is the current and the future workforce in America as well. And so I think that these families, these household incomes, their preferences are only going to grow over time, which I think highlights the importance of jumping on the connected TV trend, pretty much ASAP, right? At Ad Taxi, we tend to think about um, the metric of lifetime value for our customers. So how important is it to, of course, get a new customer in the door, but what do they represent to your business with their repeat business, right, with their loyalty? And so I think lifetime value, that metric kind of applies to this strategy as well. How can we take advantage of the fact that this is a very engaged, a young audience that's only going to grow over time and ensure that we're building that brand familiarity and brand loyalty with this group so that we can take advantage of that growth um, as advertisers when it comes, you know, when, when, when it comes down the line, essentially. So um, I think that those uh, represent unique opportunities to secure that long-term, that repeat business, you know, among these demographics. So let's also dig into then how video is being used and consumed in the marketplace. Um, I think there's some really interesting things here. And, you know, the first is that 85% of the U.S. internet audience watches videos online, um, but half of them are also subscribing to paid streaming video services. So, uh, you know, Obviously, we see the trends increasing with cord cutters and cord nevers, but 85% of people are watching videos online. Half of them are already subscribing to paid streaming video services. So they already have a Netflix or they already have Hulu or they already have a Crackle. You know, they're paying for um, some types of services to supplement or augment what they already have. The second, more video content is uploaded in 30 days 
than the US TV networks have created in 30 years. So I think this just kind of tells you about, you know, we've all heard of social influencers and content building and content building strategies. But I think that this just kind of gives, you know, some credibility to the type of scale, just the, the wealth of information that's actually out there, which is coupled then by number three here, which is more than 500 million hours of videos are watched on YouTube each day. Again, just kind of staggering um, statistics. But all three of those things, I think, uh, pale in comparison to this fourth point. It's great that video is being digested in such a way. But for me, this is the most important one, that marketers who use video grow revenue 49% faster than non-video users. And the reason I think that that's important is, uh, aside from the obvious, is the fact that people, I think, are so dismissive of video as only an awareness vehicle. Or if they have to cut budget from a plan, they'll they'll either forego bringing in video or not pay to get assets created or decide to cut it out of the plan because it doesn't have you know, that direct response nature to it, unlike a search campaign or maybe a social campaign or something like that. But the fact is, is that the proof is kind of in the pudding that people who use it to drive you know, awareness or to drive consideration and don't necessarily measure it, its value as necessarily direct response, but instead as being a lever in, in um, you know, kind of attribution or a level, a lever that helps facilitate the sale. Obviously, you can see that it does have a, a true effect on, you know, on true bottom line growth of revenue as well. So just want to call that out because I think that those are some really interesting statistics. Now, we've dug into cord cutters and cord nevers. We've identified kind of those astronomical usage patterns in the marketplace. But I think it's also important to take a look at our industry as a whole and how we're responding to things. So just over a year ago, eMarketer distributed their forecast for um, digital video ad spending. And within seven months, or well, sorry, that line, that forecast that you see um, is that purple line at the bottom. And within seven months after they, or within seven months, they revised their forecast, which is highlighted um, with a $4.7 billion increase in 2021. So here you can see the delta on the right hand side of this chart. So basically just a year ago, um, they put out these forecasts. They realized that the market was accelerating beyond their wildest dreams, and so they had to reforecast. Even in our current year, and again, this forecast came out last year. Even in our current year, they predicted that they were going to be off by about two and a half billion dollars um, in terms of video ad spending. So, not so. This basically tells me that yeah, sure, people are consuming it, but now the market is in fact responding to it as well, making it perhaps a, a bit more competitive. Um, making it, of course, a little bit more accessible for advertisers as well. So I think that all of these things um, showcase that, um, you know, that this is clearly kind of where the market is heading. And the theme so far to me, in my eyes, has been, you know, acceleration, right? As advertisers and business owners, I think it's our job to make sure that we're keeping up with the market. And if usage patterns are accelerating and video ad spend is accelerating beyond its forecasts and cord cutters and cord nevers are growing um, and accelerating beyond, you know, initial forecasts, et cetera, I think that, you know, we should be learning something from this, right? That, that this is a place that we should be playing um, if we want to make sure that we grow uh, our business. Um, anyway, so shifting gears, right? So now it's time to kind of jump into uh really the meat and potatoes of today's you know today's webinar and that's really getting into kind of the the products honestly and for today's state of you know video i think we all understand right what pre-roll video is and in banner video and those types of things but i wanted to spend the time talking about you know two core purposes of video i think the first is what we're probably all mostly familiar with which is video to drive awareness and while pre-roll does a good job of that, I really want to spend today's time talking about connected TV and addressable TV, and then talking about some of the capabilities of the technologies that can go in behind the scenes to make this a way more robust product, especially when compared to um, traditional broadcast television. I think um, you'll see that what we can do in terms of measurement on the back end and targeting on the front end um, we'll pretty, make it pretty self-evident that this is an upgrade on, on what can be done in kind of a traditional TV environment. But then on the flip side of the coin, I want to talk about video to drive intent, right? So how can we, you know, move past that stigma that it, video is just an awareness vehicle and start to focus on how can we utilize video and some really interesting capabilities, specifically within YouTube, um, that allow us to get to the point of conversion and really drive sales or enrollment or whatever your goals are um, as advertisers. And so I think, you know, we'll start to really showcase what those 
um, what those capabilities can be. So let's just kind of kick it off with, you know, the awareness side, right? And the first thing I want to do is do a quick reset. I think everybody talks about connected TV in very broad strokes, when in fact that term is, is advanced TV. Advanced TV is the umbrella uh, term essentially for watching digital TV, for lack of a better um, terminology, right? So if you're watching TV programming, but you're doing it through digital devices as opposed to through cable or as opposed to, um, you know, through broadcast, you know, over the air tech, you know, over the air um, waves, I think that advanced TV um, is that, that all encompassing term that, that includes, right, connected TV or interactive TV or um, addressable TV or video on demand, those kinds of things, right? So advanced TV is that term. Now, from there, it becomes more of a hierarchy. And for today's, for today's purposes, we'll be talking about addressable TV, then branching, or sorry, um, advanced TV, then branching out to connected TV and addressable TV. Now, connected TV is the exact same TV viewing environment and setting that you're used to, right? It's reserved for the, the big screen. It's that 65-inch TV in your basement or your living room. Um, you know, you're sitting around with the whole family watching albeit just through a like a, a device like an apple tv or through a smart tv or whatever it might be but connected tv is that big screen tv viewing that we're all used to to doing addressable tv then is simply watching tv content on our connected devices so you're watching uh, hbo go on your smartphone or you're watching survivor through the cv which is the best show on tv of course but you're watching survivor through the cbs all access app on your smartphone or your tablet something like that right that's connected tv or sorry that's addressable tv whereas connected tv like i just mentioned is that big screen tv viewing environment in your home from there now that we've kind of identified the two different ways of looking at it i think it's also important to mention that well, we don't, they're not called channels. There are different platforms for watching content um, across your devices. And the first and most rudimentary is that there's ad supported programming and there's non ad supported programming. Obviously, in advertising, if we're trying to, you know, deliver a message, we can, of course, only serve ads to those which support ads, which is what you kind of see here on the left. And these, like Sling TV, YouTube Red, Watch ESPN, um, Hulu has a basic package, right? Some of these will either be free apps or they might have a minimal paid subscription, which is then subsidized and supported by advertising. The other side of the coin is going to be those premium subscription services, which don't have ads, right? So this is Amazon Prime Video. This is Netflix. This is your HBOs, et cetera. They will carry um, a higher monthly subscription fee and not offer advertisements. So just know that as advertisers, we of course can't be on those which don't have ads here. And then from there, it starts to get a little bit more um, divvied out even further still. And it's not to confuse you, I just wanna make sure that everybody, everybody understands kind of the hierarchy with which we content is served to people across their devices. And then on the flip side, with which we can advertise to people on their devices. So from there, it, go, it turns into kind of those premium distributors, right? And this is through our OTT devices. And OTT refers to over the top. So this is gonna be like your Google Chromecast, your Amazon Fire Sticks, your Apple TVs, um, your Roku's, et cetera, right? These, are, um, these are, are platforms that essentially aggregate content or, or provide uh, an opportunity to aggregate content and then be served that content. So for example, I am a, a cord cutter. I have an Apple TV at my house, um, and if I log into or if I download the app Sling TV and I pay, you know, 30, 35 bucks a month, I can get a uh, kind of a, a light version of the types of programming or the types of channels that I could have received if I had been, you know, a Comcast or um, a Cox subscriber or something like that. Um, so I get about 30 to 35 channels of the most popular channels, but I also pay, you know, like a 30 or $35 fee. But what's interesting is that Sling or YouTube Red in that situation or DirecTV Now, whatever it might be, they are aggregating all the other channels that are in it. So HGTV might be in, in the Sling app. Of course, ESPN would be in the Sling um, app as well as, you know, A&E and all those, uh, you know, most important, all those most important programs. Now, on the other side of the coin are the direct networks. 
So these are apps that you can download individually and then of course watch the content individually as well. And within that app, they would have their own paid advertising as well. So for instance, again, because I'm a cord cutter and I have an Apple TV, I could also download, let's say the Nat Geo app, right? And in that instance, I'm, I'm open up the Nat Geo app and I'm watching Nat Geo content and then I can receive ads while I'm in the Nat Geo player as well. However, on the flip side, if I go back to OTT premium distributors, I could of course log into my YouTube Red account or my PSU account, and one of the channels in there might also be Nat Geo. So where I'm going with this is that whether it be a standalone you know, app through the direct networks or being aggregated through those content distributors, um, we're able to get a message out to, to a person however they watch. The only thing that I would say here is that it's not about the channel, right? It's not about targeting ESPN or targeting Nat Geo or targeting Discovery Channel or, or anything like that. That's, I think, kind of that traditional mindset around broadcast television is that we have to target a person based on the channel because that particular channel or that particular program indexes higher with, you know, the demographics of our core audience. But because we're talking about digital platforms here, instead we can target people off of their behavioral traits. So just because I might be, you know, typically I do like watching this show, um, The Price is Right, but every, every commercial that's on The Price is Right is about uh, prescription medicines and medicines that don't necessarily pertain to me. Had I been watching that in a connected TV environment though, rather than being targeted with um, prescription medicine advertisements, Instead, I could be targeted directly off of my um, interests and I could instead be receiving ads about, you know, golf or my favorite uh, brands or, you know, um, or exciting things to do for my birthday coming up or something like that, right? Because again, it's digital and it has those targeting capabilities, which is, I think, why you start to see that online video, connected TV in particular, gets such better um, you know, uh, I guess gets better measurements in terms of message recall, brand recall, favorability. In each of those instances, connected TV viewing uh, has nearly a, you know, a 2x performance improvement over what broadcast TV does. And again, I think that it comes down to either one, fewer ad positions, and two, uh, the fact that the targeting of the advertising is so much more direct than what you get with traditional broadcast TV. Which brings us then to, you know, the types of targeting that can, of course, be done. And I think the first is, you know, connected TV, any of, you know, advanced TV can layer in first party data targeting and first party targeting is your holy grail, right? So whether it be cookie activity on your website or past purchaser list, customer list, point of sale data, uh, CRM data, anything like that that you have, um, great opportunity to use that and funnel those into our campaigns to directly reach your audience and exclusively reach your audience of first party data targets. But then of course we can jump over to lookalike modeling as well, which is essentially adding almost like a halo effect to your first party data. If you have you know, a thousand people who are your past purchasers, well, we can apply lookalike modeling to find concentric layers of people that look exactly like those thousand people of your first party data essentially giving more power to that data. So really, really interesting tool there. And again, we can do this across all our digital campaigns, but of course we can apply it to our advanced TV campaigns as well. The ability to layer in third party data targeting, which most people are probably familiar with. This is, you know, behavioral targeting, targeting people based on, you know, gender income, traits, demos, et cetera. Uh, and then of course the ability to retarget on other devices. So what's interesting is that we can, you know, make good use out of any created video assets. If you make a video asset specifically for connected TV, we can use that to retarget people across their iPads, their smartphones, their laptops, their desktops, social media, video, et cetera, as well. So really great opportunity to um, provide extended reach and frequency off of an asset that you have by retargeting across devices and platforms. And then lastly, the ability to geo-target, which is I you know, I think pretty self-explanatory here. Now I include this because a lot of times when I'm sitting across from people, they're asking me, well, what's the best content to include in my video or what's the best length to include in my video? And in a slide, I'll be able to show you some of the content suggestions, but 
in, in a nutshell here, in terms of length, it really boils down to make sure that it's less than 30 seconds. I think after that point, um, you know, most of the media players and companies out there, they already, ch they already charge you after, after you've surpassed 30 seconds. And beyond that, you start to really lose interest um, from people after that 30 second mark as well. So of course, make sure that it's less than 30 seconds. And I think there's a strong argument to be made to keeping it closer to 15 to 20 seconds as well um, in terms of interest and engagement. Now, Connected TV, uh, it does a great job of really making sure to, to bring kind of that, that similar TV experience, uh, similar TV watching experience to the household, right? It has TV's impact in the sense that it brings sight, sound, motion, any motion in a very unique storytelling type way, um, you know, to, to an audience. But it also has digital's precision, right? So all the benefits that come with digital, whether it be on the front end with targeting or the back end with reporting, um, and all the things in between, I think that's where you start to see the real benefits of, you know, connected TV versus traditional. So let's dig into these things, right? The first, we can reach consumers beyond traditional TV. And what I mean by that is we've already talked about how trends are increasing for cord cutters. There's already an established base of cord nevers. So if it's a matter of reaching people who are, you know, no longer existent in traditional paid TV um, programming, or it's just a matter of supplementing your traditional TV um, efforts to make sure that you get increased reach among that audience of, you know, millennials or the future families of America, et cetera. It's a great way to make sure that you do in fact get that kind of saturation. The second piece is that we can, you know, we can optimize based on message device and time. The beauty of digital is that everything is analytics, right? So we can start to report out on what, you know, what devices are digesting this content the best, which um, you know, days of the week, weeks of the month, you know, times of the day, et cetera, are, are reporting out the best in terms of watching through to completion or delivering you know, website visits, et cetera. So the ability to optimize in real time based off of actual performance, again, is a big differentiator between that and traditional TV. The ability to build immersive you know, creative experiences, because we can segment audiences based off of their website activity, is a great opportunity for sequencing our message and kind of nurturing that message as well. So what I mean by this is, let's say a person comes to your website, or let, let's say a person doesn't know who you are, and they start to see kind of a prospecting video, a general awareness video. Then at a later date, they go to your website. Now we can start to say, okay, this person has engaged on their website. Rather than delivering that same um, awareness video, now we might wanna give them a video that's more specific to uh, the products that you offer or the services that you offer. And then a person comes to your website, you know, returns, I, say, I should say, back to your website, and they start to click around on a few more pages. They visit all those product description pages, et cetera, clearly a little bit more engaged. Now they became a further segment down the funnel of, you know, maybe perhaps we call them intenders. And from there, we deliver them like a case study video or a testimonial video, which essentially pushes them over the edge to the point of purchase. And what we've done there is we've sequenced that message and we've made really good use out of the, the data and the analytics that are available to us and made sure that we're always pushing a person down the funnel to the point of um, conversion while also giving them three or four different creative formats to pay attention to with, which prevents them from falling victim to kind of that, that blindness of advertising, right? So it always keeps them fresh and on their toes. The fourth thing then is that it's 100% viewable and you get great completion rate. So it's the only position in front of you. Obviously, it's a TV environment, so you what's on screen is on screen. But the only way to um, prevent the advertisement from playing through to completion is to essentially turn off the programming or turn off the, the device. So awesome completion rates, awesome viewability. It's obviously all layered into, because it's digital, it has all the same types of brand safety features that uh, we guarantee in all of our campaigns, whether that be fraud protection, viewability, um, or the ability to uh, make sure that we're staying away from, uh, you know, kind of taboo subjects that would be otherwise blacklisted, right? So it's always making sure that we have that contextual um, brand safety. And then lastly, the piece I want to harp on is that it's measurable. And I think that this is kind of the key differentiator um, between what digital TV, you know, connected TV brings to the table um, versus traditional. I think the first, the best way to understand this is to really talk about view through and cross device attribution. So I think everybody's probably familiar with click throughs and click through rates and <clears throat> in which a person sees an ad, they click on it, they go to the website and that's registered as a click as part of a click through rate. 
But what's interesting is that the average person is served about 1,700 banners per month. And only 8% of online users account for 85% of all clicks. So if we ever optimize to clicks or click through rate, you're essentially optimizing to that 8% of people or that significant minority of people, right? Which to me is, you know, if you're, if you're making decisions off of that, it's a good way to, um, you know, make some pretty short sighted decisions. So what I tend to do is layer in what we call view through technology, which is pretty similar in, in its concept, um, but it ultimately gives us insight into 100% of the audience. So view through works that when a person is shown an ad, but does not click on it, right? And then at a later time, that could either be in one minute by opening up a new you know, web browsing page and going to the advertiser's website. It could be once they are on their lunch break a few hours later and they decide to go to the website. It could be during the weekend when they've had a chance to decompress and they're sitting there with their family or their spouse or something like that. And then they visit the advertiser's website. In each of those situations, because they saw the ad and at a later date went to the client's website, that would be recorded as a view through. And essentially, because anybody who's exposed to the ad either takes action or does not take action in going to the advertiser's website, essentially view throughs, post impression views uh, account for 100% of you know, the power, if, if for lack of a better term, of that ad. And the concept is very similar to that of a billboard. Right. So if you're driving along the side of the road, you might see something that, you know, piques your interest, but rarely are you going to dig out your cell phone at that particular time, call the number that you saw and had a conversation about the goods or services that were being advertised. Instead, what might happen is you're going to go to, like I said, your lunch break or you might come home after work. And at that point, once it jogs your memory, you might pick up the phone and make a, and make a call. So view through technology is very similar to kind of that awareness, right? That, that touch point that, um, that you get with a billboard message. Now, it's also important to understand cross device attribution to kind of tell the full story here. What I mean by that is, as I already mentioned earlier, I am a cord cutter. I have an Apple TV. I also have an iPhone, you know, a MacBook, all this kind of stuff. And what I do here is, or sorry, what happens here is in each of these devices, I'm logged into either Safari or I'm logged in using my Apple ID and essentially it can connect the dots right between all of those different connected devices. So when I see an ad on my Apple TV, right, when I'm watching connected TV and then at, you know, either that minute in time or a later date, I purchase off of say my iPhone or my iPad or, you know, my computer or something like that, the connected TV ad will get credit for having a hand um, in that conversion or in that website visit, right? Because we're able to draw the line of uh, connection between all those devices through cross device attribution. And we're also able to measure that cookie activity because of the view through technology that's behind the scenes as well. So awesome technology, a great way to ensure that the connected TV and our video efforts are getting the credit that they deserve in an era where we're so groomed to thinking about kind of that direct response or that last click attribution. So just wanna make sure that I'm showcasing um, showcasing that as well. Now, talking about reporting, I do want to switch gears just for a quick moment because while this isn't necessarily, um, you know, like the glossy report that you would get, I want to highlight some of the capab or some of the the reporting capabilities that are out there uh, for advanced TV, which are different from what you see in broadcast TV. So we're able to report out on exactly how what audiences have seen and watched these watch videos through to completion or to a certain percentage of completion. So here we're able to show, and this is an indexing, we're able to show that 51% of male of impressions went to males, 49% went to females. These different age groups that you see, these are all um, recorded impressions against those age groups, against this income, against its net worth. We're able to show performance by city, how they watched, right? The number of unique impressions, so the number of unique people that were exposed to our video ads that you see here in this kind of third column on the right or on the bottom, the, com the percentage completion that they watched, the frequency with which they saw the advertisements, and you kind of get the picture, right? The different devices, so whether it's an Amazon Fire Stick or an Apple TV, Google Chromecast, those kinds of things. And moving forward, day of the week, right? Time of day, and again, I. 
I'm just kind of fly, flying through these things. But also I think, and perhaps the most important thing coming out of this is the ability to measure those, that website activity coming out of um, connected TV. And again, it's because of you through technology and cross device attribution, like I was just referencing. But here you can see, these are the conversions, the site visits that took place by time of day, by device, by day of week, um, by city as well. So really cool things that we can do here. And again, this is all website activity that's taking place after having seen a connected TV ad. Anyway, so hopefully that kind of showcases uh, a little bit about what that what those key components are in the back end, I think, of, of connected TV. But a minute ago, I also referenced, you know, what are the different types of videos that we can do to make sure that we're spanning the whole funnel in driving conversion? Here you see, you know, just a couple examples. Uh, you've got brand engagement educational videos to drive awareness at the top, explainers or product videos to drive that consideration and, and kind of intent. And then you've got the testimonials, those brand reinforcement videos, et cetera, to get people over the hump to, to actually make the decision. And then thank you or upsell videos to you know, maintain loyalty or that lifetime value that I was discussing at, at, the, at the beginning. And so we're connected TV and just advanced TV in general does a great job of driving that awareness and that consideration at the top. I think YouTube becomes kind of that key driver for all activity, not, a, not only of course across the entire funnel, but a key component for anything at the bottom of the funnel as well. And the fact of the matter is that YouTube just has the viewership to find those customers at scale. Like I mentioned earlier, it's the second largest, second largest search engine, second only to Google. And of course, Google, like I said, is the, is the number one search or also owns YouTube. And so because of that, not only do you get the insights and data that comes with having such scale, but you also have the ability to, um, you know, kind of cross pollinate the capabilities between the two. And one thing that I found extremely interesting is that 1.5 billion global monthly viewers are watching more than one hour per day on their mobile devices alone. So that should give you the kind of the, um, you know, the some insight into how people are, are digesting this content. And I think everybody can think of a time when they were on that slippery slope and we're in a black hole of, you know, YouTube viewing when all of a sudden you look at the clock and it's three hours later and you just watched, you know, videos that, you know, make no sense for the last couple hours. But anyway, I digress. So um, the interesting thing is that because of all this wealth of data, right, because it does have all that scale, YouTube hasn't been able to really heavy up um, on, you know, their audience identification, really get a lot more tailored with the type of targeting that can be done. And that's because of what they've called um, intent signals. And what this means is that based on all of the activity that a person is taking is doing, whether it be their search activity, their Google map activity, the uh, apps that they're looking at and downloading in the Google Play app store, um, you know, all the different elements that take place within Google suite of products or the G suite can be basically married together to show signals of intent. What I mean by this is let's say you're planning to um, buy a house, right? You're probably going to be doing some, you know, a, a healthy amount of Google searches, looking for homes or looking for developments in certain pockets, you might be Googling different school districts or walkability scores, those kinds of things. You also are probably going into the app store, you're downloading apps like Zillow or Redfin or you know any of those real estate apps that are out there you might be going into google maps and and going to new home development um, neighborhoods or or something like that right and so basically what google has been able to do is string all of these things together and show hey this guy joe jost he's showing all the activities or all those signs of intent of being a, a home purchaser or would be home and pur purchaser so i can get bundled into that home and tender list right which makes me a very precise target for anybody looking to advertise to that kind of target audience. So that becomes a really useful tool against three you know, new capabilities that, tar or that, uh, that Google has introduced. And the first, while it's not necessarily new, it's certainly augmented, and that's affinity targeting. Affinity targeting is essentially uh, Google's version of behavioral targeting, right? So looking at kind of interests and behaviors, um, but because they're able to layer in more of that hyper-targeted uh, intent signals through the G Suite, Affinity targeting is able to reach, you know, significantly more people and show imp significant improvement on results coming out of it as well. The second then are life events. And I think this is really interesting. Basically any momentous occasion that's coming, coming up like major milestones in a person's life, clearly there's a lot of 
search and intent activity that takes place you know behind the scenes so think about it if i'm getting married i'm likely making a website on the knot.com or something similar i'm looking up photographers looking up bands looking up uh t different music options lighting cake decor all this kind of stuff so there's a lot of things that are showcasing that i am about to get married or that me and my spouse are about to get married and as a result of that because it has such a long lead time google says that they're able to target three months prior to the major milestone as well as three months after the major milestone and so you can see how that can start to get really you know we can get really creative with the type of advertising that we do against those activities right so in the event you know using the example of you know a, a wedding obviously those three months prior that's a great opportunity for uh vendors right caterers those types of companies that are that can you know really piggyback off of kind of the wedding industry but on the back end it might be um companies like uh companies like utility companies or finance companies mortgage companies because you might be buying your first house or your first car or something along those lines right or um you know essentially all those different types of things like there are are creative ways that we can use these life events to our advantage um, as part of our targeting and then the last piece then is kind of taking a, a page out of the life events book but it's called consumer patterns and rather than it being referring to milestones instead it's referring to those habitual or those frequent trips that we always make to our grocery stores, to the targets, to you know convenience stores, et cetera. So this is a great opportunity for those types of businesses or restaurants or coffee shops or whatever it might be to make use of promo activity to get people to come into their store. And we've got a couple examples that really kind of showcase some of these efforts, right? And the first is Sonos. Sonos used life events targeting to sell home audio systems to people that were um, moving and what they saw is that by utilizing life events targeting there was a 37 percent lift in purchase intent but there's also a 425 percent lift in branded searches and i think that's a good way of measuring lift because that essentially showcases how aware are people of you know your products or your products or your services so looking at branded searches is i think a great way to showcase that search or showcase um, that lift and then secondly, another example is Jimmy Dean, right? So Jimmy Dean was using consumer patterns to uh, target people who are habitually going to, uh, you know, buy breakfast at restaurants. So the people who are going to Caribou or Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's, whatever it might be, and instead getting them to purchase, um, you know, breakfast sandwiches to make it home before they go. And they found an 18% lift in purchase intent and 425% lift in brand searches as well. So again, just showcasing the, the unique um, you know, capabilities of these to get further reach as well as drive further intent. Now, I think we're all probably decently familiar with YouTube, but I just wanna go over the two ad formats that are most um, readily available to us. And the first are TrueView ads. TrueView ads are very similar to kind of a pre-roll ad position, what we're you know, most familiar with. It's a 15 or a 30 second spot. It's skippable inventory and you only pay uh, if once a person has gotten to the end of the video or gotten to 30 seconds whichever comes first so in the instance let's say you have like a 45 second long video despite the fact that that's not necessarily best practices if you have a 45 second video you'd be charged at the 30 second mark because that's what google um, has kind of mandated for their billing but then the second piece of this the second one which i'm sure we've all seen are bumper ads and these are six second ads they're non-skippable they're kind of that short snackable ad that is really a good touch point good touch point for maintaining that reach and that frequency um, in order to stay top of mind now earlier i talked a little bit about you know sequencing right and talking about how we can pay attention to the different segments um, in terms of how they're interacting on our website and i think that that's um, a great strategy to be utilize, to be using um, in YouTube as well. So leading with say a 30 second true view spot, uh, which of course is skippable. So once a person has gotten to you know the end, we would be focusing on only people that have gotten to 100% completion because to us that identifies a qualified audience. So let's find as many people that are going to watch through to 100% completion, not skip that first ad. Once they've done that. Let's segment them into a new bug, a new bucket, right? And give them six second bumper ads. Something that just refamiliarizes them, keeps that touch point going and maintains top of mind. But again, it's six seconds. So it's not delivering a ton of content. And then from there we can deliver a second six second bumper ad with a different type of creative 
that is ultimately trying to get us to take a new type of call, uh, call to action, utilizing some of the capabil capabilities that we'll see you know, in the next slide. And what we've done now is we've avoided banner blindness. Uh, we've made sure that we're keeping content fresh and engaging. We've also made sure that we're making good use of kind of the segmentation and retargeting capabilities that are available to us through these different creative formats. So again, very rudimentary look at how this could look, you know, with this, you know, one, two, and three step process. But I think what you see is um, a really good, uh, you know, vignette into how that kind of strategy can look. Now, what I was talking about a second ago in terms of making good use of the capabilities that YouTube has, here's three really interesting things that really drive conversions. The first, true view for action. So true view for action, we can layer in a call to action, um, you know, these call to action banners with the goal of driving on site activity. So this is very similar to what you see with Google pay per click or Google, you know, search paid search ads that you see oftentimes having some of those extensions, right, that allow us to reduce the click path that it takes to get from Google or YouTube to that particular page on a website. And I think that, you know, this uh, gives people to that content that they're that they're looking for. And again, it, it shortens that bridge from kind of video to point of conversion. The second then is YouTube for shopping, which is of course tied to a shopping feed and looks and likely to an existing, you know, shopping campaign. And what you see here is in the bottom of this ad, there are a couple products that are tied to product listing ads. And in, you know, below that video position, you see uh, these obviously these these products that you're able to purchase directly. Um, from there, or it takes you to the Google Shopping environment from which you're able to purchase as well. So this is tied to a shopping feed, like I mentioned, and it makes good use of, you know, those six second kind of bumper ads to tease that top of mind frequency play. And then the last piece is location extensions, which are also very similar to those typical search campaigns in that they allow easy access to a business's location via map, you know, call or site visit, something like that. So what you see here is that as this video plays, uh, the area beneath it drops down very similar to a google my business setting allows you to tap the map for direct access see reviews those kinds of things so three very cool um, ad formats that can make use of the sequencing that we saw previously but also allow for um, you know a very short click path over to the point of purchase really driving that low funnel activity that we were talking about so we're just about to wrap up here but i think the last thing i want to bring to the table is I think everybody understands that uh, search campaigns can power YouTube campaigns in the sense that if you have a keyword list in your search campaign, we can utilize that keyword list in our YouTube campaigns to target people that are looking for those terms as well. But it's a two way street right now we're able to make really cool use of um, the viewing patterns, uh, the viewing activity that takes place in YouTube and now funnel that into our search campaigns to um, to get more or to essentially create a data segment of people that have already interacted with us and hopefully have more um, of an ability to close or convert that person because of you know their activity within YouTube up to that point. And what I mean by this is what we can do is we can find people who have recently viewed your videos and then add them to a YouTube remarketing list. So we essentially create a new list or a new ad group of people who have watched your videos. So now that we have that remarketing list, we can funnel that into our existing um, search campaigns. So rather than only focusing on certain keywords, now we can instead focus on people who have visited or sorry, who have viewed our YouTube video ads. And so from there, we can retarget those YouTube viewers on search with text ads to make sure that we're increasing that purchase uh, consideration or increasing that intent. And so what we've done is we've been able to create that two way street or almost that symbiosis between search and um, YouTube and make it so that search is not only funneling YouTube, but YouTube activity is also funneling retargeting efforts on search. And then lastly, we can report out on how this particular ad group um, is performing when compared to the rest of our search campaigns. So it should show which in like, like what we see in all of our campaigns that with the advent, or sorry, the increased um, exposure to multiple platforms, we increase that brand familiar, familiarity we increase that engagement with our quality audiences. And as a result, we're able to increase um, the core metrics of, you know, of our campaigns, which are reducing cost per acquisition or increasing our return on ad spend. So um, really cool things that we can do between search and YouTube. And so just to round it all out, the last thing I would say is 
that, you know, we talked about cord cutters. We talked about how people are reacting in the market. We've talked about how the industry itself is, you know, growing in, in such an accelerated fashion. And of course, we talked about how video can be used to drive awareness and intent. But but why? But basically, why does it make sense now to to really focus on video beyond all those things that I mentioned? I think it boils down to three things. Um, the first is cost, right? I think production is only getting cheaper. The environment is only getting more um, competitive. So as a result, ro uh, rates will be reducing. And on top of that, connected TV, advanced TV, it's cheaper than anything that would be done on broadcast TV or traditional TV um, you know, over the airwaves. So basically, whether it be the content creation or the actual execution, uh, we're in an age where those costs are only coming down. The second, targeting on the front end and reporting on the back end. The types of targeting that we can do to target specific audiences as opposed to uh, you know, programming or channels that indexes higher for those audiences uh, is is a clear differentiator. If you think about traditional TV, essentially you have to hope for a perfect miracle. One that you're buying the right audience because it indexes highly for that you know for that particular program. Two that that audience is in fact watching. Three that that audience, despite watching, is in fact in front of their TV or not on a, you know another one of their devices. So essentially you're kind of waiting for that perfect storm. Whereas within connected TV, we're able to deliver with 100% guarantee to your to your target audience and in doing that because there's such few ad positions they're non-skippable it can't be recorded with DVR or anything like that and fast forwarded through you're also ensuring that they're going to be watching as well and then the last thing that I would talk about is just integration with other digital products video is just whether it be connected TV pre-roll YouTube etc it's only one component in an omni-channel message, right? So being able to create a streamlined campaign, making use of full funnel activity with video, with social media, with uh, programmatic, with email, right? With all these digital capabilities that are available to us, it's natural that we can integrate connected TV with the types of targeting, with the types of reporting, with the type of concerted effort to, um, you know, the goals of your campaign being complete in complete alignment with every other aspect I think it's kind of a no-brainer that you know connected TV, advanced TV becomes a very serious consideration for anybody looking to you know grow in their business moving forward, or looking for alternatives to traditional and broadcast TV as those metrics only continue to decline. So with that, I want to say thank you to everybody again for taking the time out of your day to you know sit through this 2018 state of video. Uh, if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to me directly. You will receive a recording of this webinar so you can have that handy and listen to my uh, my voice talking about these things as many times as you would like. But again, if as I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out directly to me or your local ad taxi rep. Thanks.